I've been asked numerous times where some of the information has come from from the series that we've been doing as we give a lot of historical background to some of the gospel messages. I decided to show you the book right here. It's, it's, um, it's really good. It's called What is God Like? This was, came from the Long family. They, and, and this was um, basically, I, I'll read you a few chap, verses of it. Are you strong or gentle or ever sad? Do you have a temper like me when I'm mad? Where do you live? In a house in the sky? How do I know you are somewhere nearby? What is God like? So let's close. <laughs> no, sincerely, this is, this is obviously it's funny because funny we've talked about this, and this is a cute children's book, How to Describe Who God Is and things like that. But that's a, quite a question. What is God like? That's why we had the series, Discovering God. We want a clear picture of what God is like. Who is God? How does he think? What are his values? How does he reflect, look at us? Because I know how I filter that information down. How I think about God, my image that I create in my mind, will directly impact my relationship with you. It will directly impact my relationship with myself. And it will directly impact my relationship with God. What do I filter my thoughts through? And that's been the purpose of this series, where I think in our fourth week or fifth week, whatever it is now, um, where, what is God really like? So we have been taking some gospel um, parables and some gospel accounts like we'll do today, and we've been framing it back into 2,000-year-old Palestinian peasant culture. And that's where these things happen. When Jesus taught the parables, when Jesus did some of these miracles, you understand his audience was not 2015 audience. It was an ancient audience that had certain norms and customs, uh, values, prejudices, and things such as that, that these stories, these parables, as we just, I think, spent three weeks in Luke 15, had, were filtered through. So what we read in 2015 in our English Bibles, though we get significant points out of that and understanding from that, it's, um, my friends, sometimes fall far different or at least not as thorough and complete as when you frame it historically and custom in the customs of, of the day. The problem is most people answer this question, what is God like? And they filter it through their own experience or they filter it through religion, denominational religion. Um, Religion, I'm not a church basher because I'll be so bashing myself. I do church. And a lot of people want to write books about how bad the church is. I don't believe that. I believe you're God's children. And to, 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 to bash the organized church is to take a swipe at the very the thing that God created. So I don't want to go there. But sometimes, sometimes we relate maybe God to people in the church or maybe a particular control thing a, a particular church may have. Um, religion has often, but not in all cases, failed to bring its followers really to a full and correct image of the God that we worship. And, and this message won't do that either, unless we take it home and we think about these things and we reflect on these things. I've been on this road for 30 years and I'm a grace-based teacher and preacher and, and, um, and I am consistently untangling wrong concepts about God in my own mind and my own heart. I go legal on myself, not as much on people, but I go legal on myself just like that if I give myself any time at all. Usually, we reduce God down to behavioral practice, missing really the heart of what he wants us to see. Now, as stated, I believe in week two, we went through quickly John 1, 1 through 18, where John co-equates Jesus with the Father numerous times. Um, so he sees, anyone seen the Father, seen me, they've seen the Father. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, to the disciples, and really Peter here, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then he said this, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What do you mean you have seen him? You've seen him. Through me. I am the Father let out. I'm the first 18, the exegesis of God, if you remember a few weeks back. I'm the Father let out. 
If you're wondering what God is like, if this is your question, what is God really like, then I am living, my, I am living out God's life on earth. My name's Jesus. I'm the Son of God, co-equal with the Father. So if you want to see what God is really like, then look at my life, look at my values, look at the things I said, look at the things that I did. And then you'll find out and get a clear picture of what God is really like. Apart from maybe my own spin um, on things. Today, this morning, I want to look at the story of two ladies. I had three ladies, but I wanted to have lunch today. And I realized it was going to go a long time if I did the third lady. So we'll do the next lady next week or, or something like that. Um, but these are not famous people. They're average people. They weren't teachers. They were just people like you and I. I. They brought their lives to the feet of Jesus and they needed God to intervene for them. They needed an advocate. And Jesus gives us a great picture in these stories of the Father's heart. And I pray, my friends, that this will minister to you as it did for me. John, Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to start in verse 21. In the uh, NIV Bible in front of you, that's on page 1025. If you're in this section, you have the gray English Standard Bible. That's on page, what time? 566. I'm making it easy on you. In a few weeks, we're starting a new format. The verses may not even be up here. So if you don't have a Bible, we have them on sale for $299 in the, in, in the bookstore. So it's so, a special bargain just for you. Um, verse 21. Now, Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And Sidon. Those are Gentile areas. That's the bad side of town. He didn't travel down there. Okay, but he was there. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now I'm going to stop there and just talk a little bit about this because if you're a parent, most of you probably are parents, have parented at one point, and you see a sick child, one of your ch children a sick, um, it's sort of Sort of occupies your mind, doesn't it, a little bit? Especially if they're really sick. Imagine if your child was demon-possessed. I don't know if you've ever seen demon possession. I personally haven't. I saw a few people I think are demon-possessed person, but that's just my opinion. Um, but no, I have never seen that, but I've read accounts of it and seen it. You can imagine it's a pretty oppressive thing. It'd be a pretty scary thing to watch your child being thrashed about doing unnatural acts, saying unnatural things, things from a supernatural realm. What would that do to a parent as you enter into the heart of this dear woman here? So she finds the Lord, this Canaanite woman, finds, have mercy on me, son of David. She's saying to Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the one that's sent for the Jews. She's not a Jew. The Pharisees didn't see that in Jesus. The disciples were probably just getting convinced, but this woman saw it. You're the Messiah of the Jews. He goes, have mercy on me, for my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Very strong language. This girl was in, in, in a horrible, horrible situation. Painful, emotional, in every which way. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> wow. And she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Now, first lady I want to introduce you is a needy and broken woman that meets God. She had immediately two barriers to overcome. She was a woman. That's the first barrier. Back in that day, Jewish men did not have to acknowledge an unknown women. They didn't even really have to acknowledge their Jewish wives. They could ignore their Jewish wives, and that was a cultural norm. 
Some of the ladies here are thinking right now, I didn't know I married a Jew. <laughs> that was normal. They, they just, they just, now, if a Canaanite woman went to a Jewish man, that would, he'd, she would most likely get the hand. There wouldn't be a conversation going on because a Jewish man didn't have to talk to a woman anyway of a, of a Jew, never mind a Canaanite woman. So there's a barrier she had to overcome. And you can see Jesus' behavior here really wasn't over the top. The disciples weren't saying, Whew, I can't believe the Lord's snubbing her like this. No, that was sort of normal. That's what they did when you put it back in that culture. This was a normal thing. It wasn't really anything out of the ordinary here. So the first thing she had overcome was the fact that she was a woman. And just a commercial here. As we'll see in a moment, as we get through the rest of this, this story, Jesus gave great dignity to women. In fact, it was the only religion of the day, and really, my friends, if you look outside the realm of, in, in the world today and other world religions, you'll find that a woman's dignity is still compromised and muted around the world. Christianity came in and changed the value of women and gave value to women and equality to women. Christianity, Christianity is not repressive to the female gender. Just the opposite. It's freeing the female gender. Read 1 Peter chapter 3. There's a difference of genders, don't get me wrong, but in Christianity a woman finds her freedom and finds her totality there. She was a Gentile, second barrier she had overcome, a, a woman Gentile. She was supposed to be ignored. Now, Jesus was, had this interaction in this um, story, and I'll be going back and forth from the story, I think, how this pans out here, was really directed at two targets. He had this lady that was making a ruckus. Be merciful to me, son of David, be merciful to me. But he had these disciples over here, too. He, was, he wanted to teach these disciples something they didn't realize about God. And that was part of, I believe, what he did and why he said what he said. Now, Jesus didn't go easy on her. First thing he did, he ignored her. Second thing he did, he insulted her nationality, putting himself as a Jew above her. Third thing he did was equated her to a dog. Again, not that unculturally abnormal. They equated Jews, equated Gentiles as dogs. Dogs were not the little white fuzzy pets we have today. They were scavenger beasts. They were not a well, no one looked for dogs. Dogs just basically ate the garbage off the, off the streets. So, then, so now he focuses his, his attention on the, on the disciples. Because what did they do? Well, they had a little bit of a gang mentality. They look at Jesus and well, the Lord's ignoring this woman, and, um, and this woman's not given up. Send, Lord, send her away. Get her out of here. I mean, she's, she's ruining the us time that we have with you. <laughs> you know, know what basically he's, they're saying to him? He goes, Lord, or they're saying to the lady, I should say, we don't care about your Gentile daughter. We don't care that she's demon-possessed. We don't care that she's racked with pain. We don't care. Go away. You're just a Gentile. Go away. Send her away. We don't care what your problems are. Lord, will you do that? Will you send her away? But this is what he wanted the disciples to learn here. First of all, that, the, that God cared for this lady. That every human life has value. Everyone is seen equally in God's eyes. This lady matters to God and you want to send her away. They're probably just feeding off Jesus' cultural cues there. Because that's what they did. 
God, does, he, God wants you to know he does not take human neediness and brokenness with an unmoved or calloused heart. He cares. Jesus heard the cries of this woman. He cared for the cries of this woman. My friends, because Jesus is the exegesis of God, God cared for the t- cries of that woman. God heard her cries. God saw her concern. God saw her tears. God saw it. That's why we have this snapshot of God through Jesus. Jesus obliterated racism. There is no place for racism in God's, in God's, amongst God's people. He wiped it clean. Is that Gentile woman, that one that we've been calling dogs? God cares for that woman. God knows her name. God knows her pain. God knows her needs. And God's going to intervene for that Gentile woman. That's the God I want you to know. That's who he really is. That's what God is really like. Doesn't ignore her pain, doesn't eschew her pain, doesn't look the other way. Takes it head on. To the lady, he says, your daughter is healed and your daughter is delivered. Your faith is And I like this, in my nature, cut through the negative and caustic way I was treating and speaking to you, I couldn't insult your faith away. (laughs) I tried. That's why I said, oh, I've never seen a faith like this. How great is your faith? I couldn't make it go away. I tried to insult you. I called you a dog. I ignored you. I did everything I could to make you turn away, and you didn't do it. And ma'am, I want you to know this, that I am for you, And God is for you. And he'll be for you tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And you may have the Jewish nation calling you a dog, but God doesn't see you as a dog. He sees you as a human being and you have great value. And that precious daughter of yours has great value. Because the power of heaven just intervened on her behalf. I don't take your pain for granted. I hear your prayers, see your heart, and thank you for believing in my goodness when you have seeming evidence to believe the contrary. Radical things 2,000 years ago. Radical thing just took place here. The disciples were probably a little bit like, really? Really? Couldn't you have told us you're going to do this before we told us to send her away so we wouldn't look so stupid? <laughs> now, Jesus, I want you to learn something. You guys are still racist. You look at her as being somewhere less than yourself. And I'm telling you, the God in heaven, the Father, knows the pain of her daughter and knows the pain, her pain as a parent. And he wants to intervene. Because God the Father cares for her needs. Think on these things when you think contrary to that. Think on these things when all of a sudden you you somehow think that I have to do this or I have to do that in order for God to be approved to me. And think on these things. Because that's not what God is like. God sees value in you. Now, not after you clean up your act, not after you start performing better, not when you get more consistent, now, and despite you may have scrambled eggs for brains, and you can't, you can't connect, you're just all over the place, you're a butterfly in the hurricane of life, blown everywhere, God cares for you now just the way that you are. Next woman is a a guilty woman. The first was a needy woman. I don't have that on the screen. I should have highlighted that. A guilty woman meets God. This account is found in John chapter 8, page 617, the gray Bibles, 1119 on the brown Bibles. Now, it's important to really start the story of John chapter 8 in in John chapter 7. I had Matthew there, I was wrong. In John chapter 7, and I encourage you to read John chapter 7 because it's really pretty pretty cool chapter as it leads into um, chapter 8. Jesus in John 7 clearly claims his deity, and he's getting some people really mad. 
<laughs> Especially the Pharisees, the religious people. They're getting a little ticked off at him. The Pharisees, they, they know he's teaching these things, so the Pharisees send the, the temple guard out to arrest him. The temple guard comes back empty-handed. The Pharisees, where is he? He goes, you know, we've never heard anything like this guy. We, we couldn't arrest him. <laughs> they were just amazed at Jesus. They didn't want to arrest him. So they got mad. The Pharisees are mad at them. And I, said, I believe it's the last verse in John chapter 7. They all just went home. <laughs> so the Pharisees are like, okay, we got Jesus teaching some heretical things. That should be enough for us to get him. But the people love him. He's blowing everyone away. He's doing these amazing works. We got to find a better way to get Jesus. It's like a chess match. How do we get him? How do we discredit him? How do we make him look bad? Huh. So it's, it's really quite an amazing thing because the very next round of this battle starts the next morning. The Lord comes right back. In chapter um, um, verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. So early the next day, he goes home, comes right back to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. I'll just stop right there for a moment. So he goes home. He knows the Pharisees' intention. He comes right back to the temple. Some, well, let me finish reading the story. Then we'll go back and comment, comment on it. Verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? <laughs> they said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who was out sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. But once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when he heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now, go, from now on, sin no more. Interesting. Now, let's do a little surmising here. Where do you find? They all go home. It's, it's in the evening. Somewhere between the evening and the morning, they find a woman caught in adultery. How do you catch somebody in adultery? I guess it's possible, but it's not something that happens every day. Um, where was the man? Last time I knew, adultery took two people to involve that. In Leviticus 20, 20, I mean, the man should have been there too. It's funny because in John 7, they ridiculed the people for not knowing the word. But here we are in John 8, violating the word. When they should have had the man there. Or could, it, or could have it been a setup to get Jesus? That's the most common thought. We're going to get Jesus. This is a chess move. This isn't really about the woman. This is about Jesus. We don't care about it. We want Jesus. And if he says condemn this woman, he'll lose the heart of the people. If he says, that says don't condemn her, then he's going to say he doesn't obey the law of Moses. He's above the law of Moses. Not to mention the fact there were Roman soldiers all over the place and it was against the law for the Jews to kill their own without Roman permission. So he could have been in trouble with the law. What do you do? They, didn't, they weren't interested in justice or what was right. They wanted Jesus. This was the Pharisees' checkmate move. They had backed the Lord into a corner says, we got him. Any way he answers this, we got him. And we know what Jesus shifted that away. And the hostility went towards Jesus and away from the woman. He, he takes this aggressive, pharisaical challenge and turns the attention right back on them. With verse 7, I'll quote it again. And they continued to ask him. He stood up and said, let him 
who was without sin among you, be the first to throw a stone at her. Huh. See, there was a shame-pride culture in society back then. Everyone knew there was, there was only one sinless, and that was Yahweh, God. So if anyone said, I haven't sinned, not only would they be shamed themselves, they would bring shame upon their family. The crowd turned to the eldest in the mob. That was cultural. They felt the elders will know what to do, and they looked at the most eldest person, probably a Pharisee. Okay, what do we do now? How do we answer this? Plunk. And they went home. As soon as the elders dropped it, everyone started dropping their stones. And they went home. Now, what was he writing? We don't know. I think it was something like this in the Greek. na 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 boo boo <laughs> So that's what I think it was. Really, epi, na 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 bubo, oh my. In the Greek, that's how you say it. And I think the Lord just said, what are you going to do with this? <laughs> na 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 boo boo. And he, right, I don't know where he said that, but it could have actually happened. But don't quote me, please. <laughs> so how do we discover God in this story? First of all, the religious did not seek to restore this woman. God, Jesus, I'm going to use them synonymously, had her protection and restoration as his goal. All except the Lord was indifferent to her suffering. They were religious. They'll get what they deserved. They made their bed, let them lie in it. Hey, she brought this on herself. She made a bad decision. Blame us, the religious. They didn't see a person... They didn't see somebody loved by God. They didn't see anyone with value. They didn't see somebody that Jesus was going to die for. They didn't see somebody created in God's image. They saw somebody who was guilty of a sin, and that's all they had, somebody guilty of a sin, somebody who wasn't as perfect as they were. That was their faith of judgment. Ha, we got them. This woman's sin did in no way diminish Jesus' willingness to intervene and to save her. That's a good point. I want us to spend on that for a moment. In other words, I don't, this is where I get messed up in my own head. I'm wrong. Okay, God, I know you want to bless me as soon as I get my act better. I, I know I don't, I don't struggle with outward sin. I don't battle it. I did as a young man and had things I would battle, but I don't really battle with the internet stuff and I don't battle with that. I just, those aren't issues for me personally. But my, you know what? I have this stuff up in my brain that is just like spaghetti sometimes. It's just, I think, God, you can bless me if I just get more consistent, right? I just need to be more consistent. I need to be more self-disciplined. I need to be, I got to be, I ought to be, I should have be. Should have be. Should be writing that down. That's a new word. I should have be, and, and I write all these things down, and, and now, once I get these things fixed up, then I've earned God's blessing, right? I don't need grace. I just need God to pay me for what I've earned. How many of us live there? God won't intervene for me because I'm a mess. I have failed a lot, consistently, repeatedly, and the failure has ruined my lives, my life. This woman's sin did not diminish Jesus' willingness to intervene for her. Jesus accepts the sexual code and the values of the Old Testament, but what he does is he, he removes the penalty. He did not acquit her of the charges. He simply refused to judge her. He did not condone. He also did not condemn. Jesus presents a challenge to all of us. In essence, he's saying, everyone here, ma'am, is wrong. What you did was wrong. Set up by the Pharisees or not, it was wrong. And you now have broken relationships that need to be mended and the effects of this sin may be in your life. There's a better way you could have chose. And I wish you had chosen it. The rest of you, you're ready to kill this lady 
when you yourselves are guilty of so much more. You're guilty of racism. You're guilty of judging. You're guilty of thinking that you're above another human. What makes her sin worse than yours? I do not and will not condemn her for her weakness. Surely I'll die on a cross to pay for this sin. And I'll rise again and receive myself next to the Father. So this lady, this guilty lady, guilty lady, in the entire world would know how valuable they are to you. Man, when I, when I look at you, I don't see your sin. I see somebody of value to God. Man, when I, when I look at you, I don't see somebody who's weak. I see somebody that I just love. You hearing me? When I look at you, I don't see somebody who's so, been so inconsistent for so many years. I see somebody I just want to hold dear to my heart. I want them to know how much I care for them. When I look at you, I don't, I don't see your, your, the, that whatever that besetting sin is, or sins plural, the inconsistencies of your life. I just see somebody that's incredibly important to me. And I may not condone all the things that you do, but I'll never condemn you either. I will show you a better way, but I'll never leave you to the mob. I'll always rescue you from there. If you are guilty today, and most of you are, <laughs> how do you think God thinks about you? Do you think his thoughts are those of an angry person? Ready to punish? Ready to set you straight? The God of heaven wants you to know that how Jesus, his son, dealt with this lady is how he'll deal with you. He is a God of restoration, not a God of condemnation. Amen? Jesus, thank you for these words and thank you for the precious people here. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, I've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior. I couldn't speak a better message for you. Nobody loves you like Jesus, like God the Father and the Son Jesus. No one loves you like that. They don't judge you. They don't criticize you. They don't have a bunch of prerequisites for you to come to them. You can come just as you are with all the baggage that you carry. And they accept you just the way you are. They may show you a better way, but you'll be in no way cast out. You can bring your needs, desperate as you are. You may not sense that he feels your pain, but he senses your pain. He senses your desperation. He senses the, the grief and the sorrow and the heartache that you have. Believe it. He knows the decisions that you've made that maybe brought you to a bad place. He knows those things, and he says, neither do I condemn you. Just go and sin no more. If you're here today and you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior... Salvation is not an um, accident, it's not a sequence, it's not a series, it, it's an event. It happens once in a lifetime. Once in a lifetime when a man or a woman or a child of any age or gender just look to Christ and they say, I need a Savior, will you be my Savior? In your own way, your own words, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. No one's going to embarrass you. In your own way, your own words, say, Dear Jesus, I, I'm not sure I knew what I thought about you. But after this brief message this morning, I, wow. I didn't know that you loved me so much and that you care for me. I thought I had to fix a lot of things in my life before I, I came to you. I thought I had to obey a moral code or, before you'd accept me. I didn't realize you accepted me just the way that I am. And that the changes in my life will be things that you put, do in me after I come to you. So today I asked you to be my savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed.
you said that prayer in your own way, your own words. You're not joining our church. I'm really the only guy looking. I just want to pray for her. Did anyone accept Christ into their heart today? First time. First time. Thank you. Anyone else? If you've said that prayer before in your own way, you don't have to say it again. You're secure in the arms of God. Jesus, teach me, Tim Kelly. Teach me these truths. Teach me in the way I think about myself, about others, about you. Teach me these truths, Father, because I know they'll change my life forever.